What better place to have Hong Kong noodles than in Hong Kong? Hi, I'm Melissa with the Travel Talk Podcast, where I interview expats and locals from cool and interesting places. Today, I'm with Natasha. She's from Hong Kong. She's half French, half Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese, that is. And she's going to be talking about some of the fun things she does there, including day trips that she and the other locals take to Lama Island on jug boats. You'll hear a little bit of the local jargon, including typhoons and what aircon is. And you're also going to get some local recommendations. There's so much amazing food, and Natasha definitely has some great insights about that. Let's get started. So I know you're from Hong Kong. How long was it for? What was your background? What did you do there? Tell the audience a little bit more so we could just get a little bit more context. Absolutely. So I'm actually half French, half Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese. My dad grew up in Hong Kong, a little bit of Taiwan, and my mother grew up in Burgundy in France. They met on a boat from London to Paris because my dad was just really interested in France and just the French culture. And at the time, he was studying in Boston. And after that, you know, they fell in love. She followed him to Boston, finished school there. Then they decided that the East Coast was way too cold. And then they moved to California, where they had my brother and I in San Francisco. So that's where I was born. And I actually lived there for the first five years of my life. I think my dad thought that we were going to stay there for a while. But then I think he just decided to take us back home. And maybe it was going to be for a few years. But it ended up being 13 years because, yeah, I was there from 5 to 18 when I graduated. My parents still live there. So I go back every single year around Christmas time. I guess I don't count these years as living in Hong Kong, but it's still my home. Yeah, like that seems to be your home base right now. Absolutely. You know, it's those formative years, and that's all I really knew. Other than during SARS, we actually had to flee Hong Kong for five months, and I had to finish school. Yeah, I don't think I ever mentioned that, actually. Yeah, during SARS, my mom just woke us up one morning and said, you know, pack your bags, we're moving to France. And I actually finished my freshman year in a small school in a small town in Burgundy, which was very different from, you know, the big international school I was in before. And Hong Kong is just, because it's so small, it's like huge. Everyone's on top of each other there. Exactly. But at the same time, I never really saw it as small just because, yeah, you see so many people and you meet people from everywhere, you know, whether it's Australia, Germany, New Zealand, Brazil. So you just feel like there's just so much going on and just so much culture. So let's talk more about that. The way I was inspired to come up with this podcast is I love to travel. I'll maybe have a week out of the year where I can go somewhere. Is Hong Kong a place you can see in a week? Could you see it in maybe a weekend? What could a tourist possibly get out of Hong Kong and what would be a reasonable time frame for that? Bear in mind that you will have jet lag. So if you're coming from the West, you know, we're in the US right now and we take at least two weeks to go back to Hong Kong because I count at least a week of jet lag. And sometimes it's gone within two, three days, but sometimes it takes the entire week. And, you know, it's very tiring. You'll feel sick if you even try to move sometimes. So it depends on the person. It depends what you're doing as well. So what else would surprise me? What's some things that you're totally, oh, I get this. I'm from Hong Kong. This is totally normal. But what might be unusual for me? People don't really know about typhoons. Those are hurricanes and they can get pretty strong out there. What I love and I thought was totally normal is that people tape up their windows. Like they put a giant X with brown scotch tape so that the windows won't break, which I guess I haven't really seen anywhere else. But, you know, that's normal to me. And then, nope, never seen that here. <laughs> you know, we have bamboo scaffolding that actually really stays together even during those strong winds and rain. Is there like a season you should avoid Hong Kong then? Yes, summer. Don't go that's, in the summer. <laughs> that's actually not typhoon season. That's more around. I mean, it happens throughout the year, but it's more around October, November. But I always tell people to avoid Hong Kong in the summer because it gets so hot and humid. People underestimate that. Yeah. The good thing is that actually it might be a bad thing too because we have a lot of buildings, right? Especially if you go to the northern part, that's where, you know, central is. That's where all the big buildings are, all the big offices. And it's all air conditioned, which by the way, we call air con, not oh. AC. So I still say, oh, turn the air con on. They're just blasting the air con. So you'll be cool inside, but actually you'll almost be cold inside because then when you go in between outside and inside, that's how you catch a cold because you're going from, you know, 
somewhere that's absolutely yeah. freezing to somewhere that is hot and humid. We have tunnels that go from building to building, but they're elevated. They're glass. You can see the outside, but that's how people travel from building to building and staying cool at the same time because they do not want to go outside. Oh my God. All. But I tell people, try not to go during the summer because you're going to have to be outside at some point. You'll melt. <laughs> and you'll absolutely melt. You'll feel disgusting. Like you're not going to want to spend the entire day outside. And there's so much to do. So, And when I think of like the food of Hong Kong, a lot of it's normally heated too, right? So you want to be able to enjoy that and not feel like you're melting and then eating something hot on top exactly. of it. Exactly. So I know Hong Kong's a very major city. We do a lot of business out there. I know a lot of people are there for work. What is unique to Hong Kong that a tourist would want to see? And then what is something that's local to the natives that maybe tourists overlook? When people travel to Hong Kong, the first thing I always ask them is, did you go to the south side? Because I noticed growing up in every single documentary about Hong Kong, they always, always show the big city, the city lights, like the boats and the harbor, like the very busy part of Hong Kong, like the more, I guess, New York part of Hong Kong. And so people imagine it's just, you know, New York on steroids is actually the way to describe it. And it is in the northern side. As soon as you go over the hills to the southern side, I would usually say that it's a little bit more like the suburbs, but not at all like American suburbs. But it's quieter. A lot of people live out there. We have rolling hills and beaches at every corner. And when I tell people that, they're like, Hong Kong has beaches? I'm like, yeah, we're an island. Like, And people forget that sometimes, that we're an island. I've never even been over to that side. Exactly. And it's just totally different. It's a totally different vibe. Actually, I could maybe even compare it a little more the way in Los Angeles here we have like the east side and then the west side that's just a lot more chill. So the south side in Hong Kong is a lot more chill. And you know, we do have a beach where people go surfing, which, you know, people don't think of that when they think of Hong Kong. You know, there's cool monuments, cool architecture. It's unique. And I think people need to see both sides of Hong Kong, the busy part, but then the markets by the water, for example, and the hikes. We have amazing hikes in Hong Kong. I can't even count how many we have. And that's not even considering the neighboring islands that also have many hikes. And that's actually a thing Hong Kong locals typically do. For the boat, we call it a junk boat. So we go on junk trips and we'll just cross over to a neighboring island. They'll always have amazing seafood restaurants. Like Lama Island is really popular for that. And it's just the super local, big table, family style they just throw the seafood (laughs) plate in front of you and you just dig in and share it's not fancy at all it's like plastic bowls but there's such a charm to it yeah peeling your own trim exactly yeah (laughs) oh that sounds amazing is that like a day trip that a lot of the locals make absolutely typical saturday or sunday i mean not every single weekend of course but you know when the weather is nice and you want to get together with your family or your friends like people will say hey let's go to lama island today i don't think i've ever heard of that before i think all my guides are just specific about the city of Hong Kong and I realized that there's just so much more to it. It's really nice like that was something we often did would just do a junk trip sometimes we didn't even go to an island we'd just be on the boat I mean we wouldn't be the ones sailing of course but you know we were just hanging out on the boat and brought a little picnic and we'd eat there depending on the boat sometimes they have tables or sleeping areas usually it's a day trip thing and it's a really really nice time. Uh, Did you grow up doing that? Yes absolutely. Oh that sounds great. Often birthday parties were on junk trips. I think I did my 12th birthday party on a junk boat with just the girls. That's amazing. And it was really cool. I'm pretty sure my 12th birthday party, we just went to my backyard and had a big sheet cake, <laughs> which is still delicious, but I totally want to it go on a junk boat. sounds amazing. <laughs> So you have these suburbs and you have these beaches and you have the llama that you can go to. I know dim sum is really popular in Hong Kong. What else is something that's super authentic Hong Kong? Yeah, dim sum is huge. We usually do that on Sundays, though, and only for lunch. Whereas I know in other cities, they'll kind of have it anytime. Hong Kong noodles are really popular as well. And you just have to find a hole in the wall. How do you find that? By knowing someone who lives in Hong Kong or I mean, I'm sure there are some guys that will, you know, mention a few places. But the thing is, new places pop up all the time. I mean, even in the last 10 years since I've been gone, new areas are now up and coming. And those were areas I never even really heard heard about when I was younger. 
The places we used to go out in are now more, you know, restaurants and all the bars have just moved to another neighborhood. And Soho is a really popular neighborhood for food, for example. That wasn't the case when I was younger. I would say that when I was growing up, the Hong Kong cuisine was amazing, but I cannot say that we had our fair pick of other cuisines such as Italian or anything else, even French. Whereas now you have a lot of trendy restaurants popping up that serve that kind of of food so I think that's great so could you get like a Michelin Italian meal absolutely I think Mario Vitale opened you know something over there that was something I definitely missed when I was growing up and after having lived in New York and going back to Hong Kong for Christmas and seeing that trendy places were opening up and you know people were really experimenting with food and just different flavors it was really nice to see that because Hong Kong does have such a unique culture and cuisine and that's great but I definitely think it's good to have other options as well so it's pretty much a foodie heaven you can get a bit of everything like how much square feet would you say an apartment would be I think I went in one last year and it was four or five hundred square feet so that must have been like a studio or something yeah but except it was a two-bedroom that was a two-bedroom yes Uh, so I remember when I walked into one of those empty apartments I was told it was a two-bedroom and I walk in and I can immediately tell that there's no way you can host anyone really yeah like and that's not a big thing there people after work you can't have your friends over and like host a good dinner unless you have a lot of money and (laughs) have a big place so you have these great restaurants instead (laughs) exactly it's the culture it's a lot of drinking going out and eating but when I walked into that apartment I saw the first room which I was like okay so that's the walk-in closet and then I went to the second room which I was like okay that fits maybe a full bed where's the closet And then I was told, oh, those are the two rooms and there's no closet. So that means you have to put in a wardrobe, which takes space. Is hawker food bigger there? I remember I was in Singapore and hawker food is those stalls that they have and they're just everywhere in Singapore. I think they're bigger in Singapore. That's a big thing over there. It's definitely popular in Hong Kong. We have this thing called Dai Pai Dong. So that's also like street food. I love it so much. You miss it, right? (laughs) I'm going to Hong Kong Wednesday. That's going to be one of the first things I get. Oh my God. I wish you could bring some back. Can you somehow like little care package? (laughs) Absolutely. Send it across the entire Pacific Ocean, please. I don't know if it'll still be good. It'll be a little cold. (laughs) Pocket food is definitely bigger in Singapore, but we have so much street food. And when you walk through certain neighborhoods, you know, you'll have pigs hanging out hanging upside down actually they're not hanging out (laughs) and then you'll have these cubes filled with water and all these fish and crab yeah just all this food that's alive and the woman will say hey like do you want some and you can pick your own crab pick your own fish while it's alive and all these dried foods as well so you we have a lot of those those markets awesome thank you so much for joining this has been really great do you have any last pearls of wisdom for everyone Someone asked me the other day, it's a coworker, and he's going to Hong Kong um, in December, and he asked me more about the dress code, actually. And I did remember one thing. I think when you're on the South Side, like it really just doesn't matter what you're wearing. But when you're around Central and all that, and you're going to be going through all these malls and a lot of offices, so people are on their break and they're in their suits. I feel like you don't want to show up in like just a sweatshirt. Because I remember coming back from college, and I probably had my college sweatshirt on because I was feeling lazy and I had been in Boston for too long and I went to a mall and I just was so embarrassed. Like the entire day I was like, I need to go home and change. Like everyone was dressed up and I wasn't. And you want to fit in. You want to fit in. You want to blend in. So, you know, when you go out to eat at night, guys put button down shirts. Girls still make sure they look nice nice and put together. So I would tell people to watch out for that. So have a bit of both. That's a really great tip. I did not know that. (laughs) If you're in the business city, you gotta yeah, you, you gotta at least look can't look like, yeah, exactly. You can't look like you got off your couch a little exactly. bit. Exactly. <laughs> like don't show up in sweatpants. Oh and no. And don't walk around yeah, don't walk around central in sweatpants, so please. Awesome. Well thank you so much for joining us, Natasha. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for joining us, Natasha. And for all you listeners out there, the podcast is uploaded every other Wednesday on traveltalk.me and on your mobile device please subscribe. Our next topic is going to be about the Philippines with Ted.